talk about academic motivation. We're going to be starting in another minute. We have a lot of donuts down here. The coffee's full. Trust me, the coffee is full. Come down and get some free Starbucks and donuts, and let's talk about academic motivation. Zach, are you coming? How are you? Oh, wow. <laughs> Tutoring. Tutoring is important. Good stuff. Thank you. You got lots of seats right up here, so grab your donut and your coffee and come and join us. We're excited that you're here. <laughs> They're motivated to study. I mean, what can we say? Elizabeth, how are you? I'm good. How are you? You got the memo. There's extra credit, right? No. What? But I, I keep track. I have a memory. <laughs> All right, so, so um, welcome, welcome to the exchange. So I am Stacy Donovan. I'm an associate professor of biology and forensic science here at Maryville. I've been tasked to um, lead this exchange talk on academic motivation. So like many of my classes, right, it's going to start with a pop quiz. So let's see if you can answer these questions, or maybe it's trivia. All right, so the, the title for these are called Famous Failures. So after being cut from his high school basketball team, he went home, locked himself in his room, and cried. Anyone know? Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. All right. Lachey gets a prize. Get a prize for it. Get a donut. <laughs> Good job. All right. How about this? Um, he wasn't able to speak until he was almost four, and his teacher said he would never amount to much. Einstein. All right. You guys are on oh, this quiz. That's awesome. How about this one? Rejected by Decca Recording Studios, who said, we don't like their sound. They have no future in show business. The Beatles. All right. Uh, you know what? These are all former students. They probably... <laughs> all right. And one last one. Um, was demoted from her job as a news anchor because she wasn't fit for television. Oprah? New who? Oprah. Oprah. Good job, Jake. Awesome. All right. One, one more. One more. One more. For those of you that haven't answered, there's, here's your chance. At age 11, he was cut from his team after being diagnosed with a growth hormone deficiency, which made him smaller in stature than most kids his age. Did I stump you? <laughs> no? No? Think soccer. It's Lionel Messi. Okay. All right. So I start off with that because that's something that really resonates with me when I talk about academic motivation. Um, you know, it's not how many times I succeed, it's how many times I fail, and after I fail each time, I get back up, right? I don't let that failure defeat me. Um, so I'm kind of curious here, because this is an exchange, so I want to hear some dialogue from you. What are some words that you might describe as being motivated? When you hear the word motivated, what's a word that, like, yeah, effective? effective. Study. Study. The future. The future. Goal oriented. There's no wrong answers. Shut them out. Determined. Determined. Competitive. I heard you. I got mom ears. <laughs> How about this? Committed. Focused. Tenacious. Drive. Ambition. Right? So. The, those are some words that people have used to describe me. Um, I don't know. Um, so for me, trying to be motivated and stay motivated to stay on task, I kind of think you kind of have to do one of those gut checks of why you do what you do, right? A lot of people ask me all the time, why are you so happy, right? Like, is it the air here in Maryville? Um, honestly? Um, why I do what I do. So I kind of split that both into my personal life and my professional life. Personal life, for me, it's my family. Um, that's at the center of core of what I do in my personal life. Professionally, um, my career has kind of taken a little bit of a circuitous path, right? I didn't know when I was in college that I wanted to teach. That wasn't until later on, right? My kids often ask, oh, mom, when are you getting are you, is this your real job, right? Um, so I felt like a professional student, professional learner, but I think in some ways we're all that, right? Always learning. So in my professional career, my why I do what I do is really to serve others, all right? Um, 
Before I came here to Maryville, I was a research scientist. I worked in a laboratory in St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Um, there, it was all about the kids, right? These kids fighting cancer. That was your motivation. All you had to do was go to the cafeteria, go get some lunch. Um, you might get run over by somebody whizzing past you on a tricycle, right? Chemo hooked up to them on their, on their line. Um, so if you ever thought you were having a bad day, you just had to go down and get that cup of coffee and get motivated to get back up in the lab, right? Um, that right there was really strong motivation. Moving here to Missouri, um, my husband got a promotion for the first time since I was 16. I didn't work. So I focused my time back on my family. I got the itch again, contacted a colleague at WashU, went just for a casual chat. Before I knew it, I had a job offer two days later. I was like, ooh, right? I get an opportunity to do what I love, research, science. Here at Maryville, I get a very unique opportunity to serve you, to serve the students. Um, that's what drives me. That's what keeps me up at night. So if you get that email from me at 3 in the morning, these guys are laughing because this happened. And if you you're shaking your head, mm -hmm. right? It's trying to, you know, rack my brain like, you know, I'm hard on myself. I'll go home and I'll be like, oh, you know, that, that lecture didn't quite go right. That activity failed, right? Let them down. Um, so I always kind of look at myself and say, how can I make it better, right? I think being in science has helped prepare me a lot to take that failure mentality and be okay with that, right? In the lab, how many of you have had labs where they just don't work? <laughs> yeah, right? They just don't work. And you're like, I follow directions, right? Um, that's where the biology stuff comes in because things don't always behave there. But, um, you know, there's a lot of failure there. So you can look at it in two ways. You can be like, oh, well, that didn't work, right? Um, so when I think about that, that failure, I look at, I have, a, I have a different lens on that. So let me ask you a question, and this can be rhetorical, you can answer, it doesn't matter. When you think about schoolwork, do you think about schoolwork as an opportunity, or do you think of it as an obligation? Or is it both? Maybe a little bit of both, yeah. So for me, I look at getting to serve others as a huge opportunity. I don't look at it like an obligation, like this is my job, this is what I have to do. I look at it as an opportunity, right? Those small moments, those big moments. Um, as a teacher, having students get a hard concept and have them figure it out and get it, you see that like, honestly, that light bulb go off, that's like, that's money in the bank for me. Um, so I think that when you think about those things, and when you think about failure, what comes into play is your growth mindset, right? So let me ask you this. If you're faced with an obstacle, do you give up easily or do you persist? You don't let those setbacks, right? Two steps, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing, right? Keep going. Right? Figure out your why. Why are you doing it? Why are you doing it? Right? Why, why am I going after this degree? Right? Um, do you avoid challenges or do you embrace them? Right? I know many of you have probably said, here's a marker who's going up to the board. Right? There's a challenge. Are you going to look at it and like, get that thing out of my face? Or are you going to go and grab it and be like, you know what? I might not get it right, but I'm going to try. Right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? Um, so I think that, you know, in thinking about that growth mindset, hey, Max, how are you? Good, how are you? Good stuff. <laughs> Welcome. Um, you know, is, is to kind of, when you, when you think about why you're doing what you're doing, maybe you want to set that short-term goal, maybe you want to set that long-term goal, right? Um, sometimes people call it, keep that eye on the prize, whatever that prize is for you, you know? Um, but I think that part of being committed, part of being okay with being able to fail and stay on task and stay motivated is that thing called grit, right? 
Um, Max is laughing because we're talking about this in our class, so it's good stuff. Um, has anybody heard of Angela Dunford? I see a few head shaking. Yeah, right? So that was her thing, is that grit. What is grit? Grit is that passion and perseverance for those long-term goals, all right? Um, I have some tidbits on here for you. They're QR codes. They're to two of my very, very favorite, 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 um, I would call them. Sometimes if you need that little refresher, you need that little boost and pick me up, right? These are the two things that I like to come back to. One is her TED Talk there, and another one is um, something I've shared, I think, with my Gen Bio class. I know you might remember this. The Believe in Yourself motivational video. Um, it features Jared uh, Grossman, uh, another um, motivational speaker named Eric Thomas. He calls himself E.T. Has anybody heard of E.T.? Not like the little like extraterrestrial, like E.T. Eric Thomas. <laughs> No? All right, you've got to come up here and scan this and play it on your own time. I hope that you're moved and motivated by it. Um, if you want to talk about, you know, maybe you're feeling a little bit whatever, like defeated, and you need that boost and pick me up, come find me, right? We can get coffee like this, have a donut, chit chat. Um, I'd love to do that, all right? Again, um, I faced a lot of setbacks, um, personally, professionally. Um, but you can't let that stop you, right? For me to serve others, that's that was it. That's what was pushing me. So, any questions? Questions? What did you do at WashU? What did I do at WashU? Perfect question. So, um, at St. Jude, I really thought that oh, I want to have an academic research lab, right? I was publishing two papers a, sem a, a year, a, re a review paper, and a peer-reviewed um, scientific research article. We were publishing in, in uh, journals like Nature and Cell, um, journals that have really high review ratings, so the work had to be like top-notch here. A lot of collaborations, right? Um, I had juggled five projects at one time, and left me very little time to develop my own projects. So, life happens. Um, my husband got the, the call to move up here, so that's why I think we had to, well, there wasn't time, right, to, to find my own lab and to do this, so I had to pivot. Um, so at, at WashU, I can carry on the research that I did at St. Jude, looking at development of um, a protein that's involved in childhood eye cancer and um, trying to figure out what it's doing during normal development. So my role and title there was a staff scientist. I had to write my own grant, pay for my own salary, that type of thing. Um, at the end of the three years, I, again, finished my work. Or I was committed, I didn't want to leave that unfinished. I pushed through it, it was hard, because I was the only one working on it. Um, but got a paper, got that accepted and published, and that's when um, I saw an ad for part-time adjunct teacher at Maryville. And I thought, dang, you know, this is something I always wanted to do, but I just never had the opportunity because I was so busy focused on the research. And um, I remember for my interview, they had asked me, they, I'm sure you haven't taught before, right? No. Um, I taught a lecture here and there, a guest seminar, a speaker. I've given workshops at a really famous lab up in Maine. Um, I've been traveled around the world to give workshops and that kind of thing for doing scientific surgeries. But, you know, I was like, teaching? No. No. <laughs> Curriculum what? <laughs> so, um, little did I know that I actually had a, what I would consider now like almost a full-time schedule. I had two classes, three labs, um, but I absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved it. So, yeah, and for me, I think the biggest thing is seeing the students succeed. Again, no matter if it's a student told me today she got accepted to med school, all right? Um, or if it's a student that says, I hey, passed my exam. Or, you know what, um, I got, I got, I passed my exam, I didn't get an A, but I got that C, right? So it's like, okay, man, keep digging, you know? Keep digging, is that, are you, are you happy there? Do you wanna keep digging, you know? So, but yeah, so that's what I did at Washington. Long answer. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Jake. You mentioned uh, responding to emails at 3 a.m. I cut off midnight, mm -hmm. um, but uh, 
do you have any work-life balance? Right, I know. Um, aspects yeah, to, to absolutely. To to? Yeah, absolutely. So um, once I'm home, I'm 100% mom. Right. The kids, the kids hide from me now. <laughs> so my kids are 12 and 17. So when they were much younger, um, role was a little bit different. Um, but again, now that they're a little bit older, um, they don't want me around as much. Um, I don't get it, right? I still let them win at games sometimes, but um, you know. Um, so for me, it was something I developed um, when they were very young. Um, once they were in bed and attended to and that type of thing, um, for me, I, again, I had the greatest pleasure in serving others. So, you know, where some people might think like, oh, I'm gonna just relax and watch TV or something, like, I would fall asleep. So I'm like, oh, I wanna like read an article. And I know that sounds like, what? But, you know, this type of thing to kind of push forward a little bit um, or to work on a class or this type, you know. So once the kids were in bed, I would be working. Um, and it's funny because my husband and I often laugh at this. He, he kind of did the same thing. So it wasn't like, but you know, we were chit-chatting and talking and doing this kind of thing. Um, prior to that, the work-life balance was doing home remodeling. So that's what we did for fun. Um, spackle, paint, tear up things, demo, you name it. Get this, the sledgehammer. I mean, <laughs> demo is a lot of fun. So, but as, as we knew from place to place, the amount of renovations that we had to do became less and less as we became more involved with our work. So, but yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, life doesn't stop for these students. So, um, you know, but I think that they absolutely understand, you know, if you don't get to them right away, you know, that type of thing. So, at least I hope so. Good question. Anything else? Now's your chance, right? Ask me anything. I don't care. Yeah. How did they get involved with the forensic? How did they get involved with the forensic? Yeah, great question, right? Nicole's a forensic science. Um, so I would really have to say that during the interview, it was my training at St. Jude in molecular biology. Um, my training was really broad. When I first started in graduate school, I did um, more of a systems approach to biology and neuroanatomy and looking at things with the naked eye through the microscope. And then eventually things got smaller and smaller and smaller. And I got out of my comfort zone, away from that microscope, things that I could see that were tangible to things I could not see like DNA, RNA, and it freaked me out. And I, I still get excited when I see that extraction happen and you see that pellet form and you're like, oh, that's DNA, right? So that still like excites me with that. Um, but so I would say my training and stuff there is, and also, so I think advice to students would be, if there's an opportunity, and there's that, that opportunity for not obligation, if there's an opportunity around, I would take it. Um, you never know how that might impact in part of your training, right? You have an opportunity to work on an extra project. Is that an opportunity or an obligation for you? You don't know when that might have, you know, help you. Um, the other part, I think, is my willingness to learn, right? Um, I have contacted people in the crime lab and, and, and interviewed them, asked them, you know, what's this is what I'm thinking of for the curriculum based on this accreditation in this accrediting body. What do you think about this, right? Um, and you know, I always temper that with, am I, am I being too hard? Am I not being hard enough, right? So I feel like if I go and ask the industry experts kind of what's going on and they are impressed by that, then I feel like I'm doing okay. Is there always room for improvement? You betcha, right? So. Like if you have students that might do an internship or something like that, that might know some information, like this gal here, um, you know, I definitely want you to contribute in that kind of thing. Always want students to do that. So, yeah, good question. Any others? No? Okay, well, I really want to thank you all for being here, and I also want to encourage you to go to the um, Holocaust Survivor Talk today. It's in the auditorium. It's at 4 p.m. Um, and I understand there's going to be a candlelight ceremony beforehand. Um, 
um, for those that lost their lives in the Pittsburgh Open weekend. So, um, so I hope I hope to see you there. And again, thank you for being here.